and especially this day, there's a great activity that's planned, and that is at the end of our services, we will be ordaining another man to be an elder in this church. And for that reason, I want us to talk about the truths about elders. You look at Titus chapter 1, you look at verse 5 where he says in, in that verse, Paul said, I left you in Crete because there's some things there that you need to have happening there and, they, they, uh, uh, and you need to correct them. Paul, on the, on the way to some place, left Titus in Crete in order that he might put in order things that are lacking in that place. It is the will of God that there be elders. It is the will of God that in every place there are men qualified, that there are elders in every church. And that's why I thought it'd be appropriate if we talk today about some of the truths the Bible talks about elders, teach truths about. In fact, we're going to look at eight of them. You'll see the outline on the screen of eight truths about the Bible, and so it'll help you follow along as you think about the direction. Let's look at that first truth. We need to understand that it was part of God's eternal wisdom and plan for the church to exist. It's ironic that sometimes people think, well, we're just sort of out here our own and we need to sort of figure out how to do it best and all the rest, when such could not be more distant from the truth. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, but look again at in chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 10, Paul talks about that to the intent, the manifold wisdom of God. What does that mean? The multifaceted wisdom of God. That's what manifold means. Many folds. Just look at it, and as you open it up, you just see more and more and more. As you unfold it, you see the multifaceted wisdom of God. Now then, it's manifested that it might be known by the church. This eternal, look in verse 11, the eternal purpose which He accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Look at those verses. As we look at the church, we see God's manifold wisdom in the church. Perhaps as we focus today on the matter of eldership, there's no place that we can see the manifold wisdom of God manifested even more. Imagine a man in a mission field that's starting a new church like, like happens oftentimes in the mission field. And you're there, there the church begins and there are three or four men that are baptized in that initial birth of that church. And if it were possible at that time to appoint elders, wisdom, human wisdom would say, you find the smartest man that's there. You find the most spiritual man that's there. You find the man that is the most persuasive in his ability. You find the man that has the most talent in dealing with other people, and that's the very man that you'd make to be the leader of the church. Because if you appoint more than one, you're going to weaken the whole situation. And I find it ironic that in the religious world today, that, that kind of concept is found. When there is a pastor-oriented kind of work, where the pastor is the focal point and everything that, that is done in the church comes out of his heart and comes out of his mind. But that's not the wisdom of God. Ordain elders, plural. They ordain elders, plural, in every church. There's wisdom in that. Because you take a group of several individuals like in this eldership that we have in this congregation. They're all different. Think of how different Joe and Johnny and Jerry and Dan Fuller are. Think, about, think of the difference of personalities. Think of the difference of temperaments. Some of them are better, better Bible students than others. Some of them are better at relating to people than others. Some of them have better organizational skills. And you bring all of these individuals and form them into one group and the weaknesses of one is overcome by the strengths of the others. 
And instead of the church being limited by the talents of one individual, God says, here's what you do. You appoint elders in every church that they may oversee these matters. That's God's eternal purpose. Some people think the church ought to be run like a democracy. That you just need to uh, put everything up to a vote. and Whatever the church wants to do, that's exactly what should be done. Some people's view of an eldership is that an elder ought to just sort of lick his finger and hold it in the proverbial winds of the church and see which way the wind is blowing and say, well, that's the direction we ought to be going. You know what would happen? The most immoral, ungodly individuals vote in a situation like that carries the same weight of the most spiritually minded person in the church. You know what God's multiple, multifaceted wisdom was? That you appoint men that are spiritual by nature. Did you hear the verses that were read this day from Titus chapter 1? How many of those are secular in nature? Almost without exception, every statement of there has to do with spiritual, spirituality. And the responsibility of an eldership is not to run a democracy. It's not the responsibility of an, uh, of, of an eldership just to say, well, what do most folks want us to do here? They are spiritually men ordained by God to carry the church in the direction that heaven wants the church to go. And it takes a special kind of individual to listen more to the will of God in the direction and the nature of the church than to listen to the, to the, to the voices of the masses. Oh, as we'll point out later, they're not to lord it over God's heritage, but their responsibility as a shepherd leads the sheep in paths of righteousness. So the shepherds, the elders of the church are Caution and, and appointed by God to lead this very flock in paths of righteousness. We need to understand that it is the Holy Spirit who makes elders. Look in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Therefore, Paul says to the church at Ephesus, Take heed to yourself and to all of the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Do you know why we're ordaining elders in this church this day? Because the Holy Spirit has by commandment and example given us the authority to do that very sort of thing. And that the appointment of an elder is not made by, by some decision of individuals as a matter of popularity, but the Holy Spirit of God laying out all of these spiritual qualities that a man ought to have. And the church of Jesus Christ seeing spiritual men at the very direction of the Holy Spirit. The process brings about the ordination of elders. It's not of human origin. Why do we have elders in the church? Why do we have deacons in the church? Because the Holy Spirit of God in the revelation that thoroughly supplies us unto every good works says, elders and deacons, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1, were part of the church in the first century. But there's a third thing. And that is this matter of the qualification and the appointment of elders. It's not our purpose in this lesson to look at Titus chapter 1 and 1 Timothy chapter 3 where these qualifications are given. There's another time and another place for that study to be made. But you and I need to understand that an individual who is appointed as an elder needs to be the individual who by his heart's desire and the direction of his life has pointed himself so that he might arrive at this place, at that time. And I'd say to all of you in this assembly today, and especially to you young men, that you decide now 
God being your helper, you'll someday be an elder in the church. That you never never lose sight of that. And when you think about the kind of person you marry, and when you think about rearing your children, which are things that may be far in the future, that they'll be a part of your mind and part of your heart so that you can serve God. James A. Garfield was a member of the Church of Christ. He was also President of the United States. And he says, the greatest honor in my life is not found in an appointment that was given to me in Washington, D.C. The greatest honor in my life is when I was appointed an elder in the church. And those of you who are here need to build burning within your heart a desire and read those qualifications and think about where your weaknesses are and try to find your strength. And perhaps go to those that are spiritually minded. Go to those who are elders now and say, look at my life. Where do I need to grow? You see me as an outsider. Tell me what I need to do to be an elder in the church. And then what happens? The appointment is made. We've already looked at Titus chapter 1 where Paul left uh, uh, where Paul left Titus in Crete to ordain elders. In Acts chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas, when they had preached the gospel to that city, made many disciples. They returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, saying, we through many tribulations, must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So they appointed elders in every church, it is the will of God that there be a group of spiritually minded men within every congregation where those men are qualified that they may follow the lead of the chief shepherd and cause the flock of God to walk in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. We need also to point out that the authority of an elder is congregational and never extended in the first century beyond local congregations. Later in this lesson, we'll look at 1 Peter chapter 5 where it says, The flock of God which is among you in this city, the church at Lystra, the church at Iconium, the church at Antioch, all had elders. But the authority of those men in that eldership did not extend from city to city. But every congregation had its own elders. Just in passing, this makes it impossible for Satan to take over the church of Jesus. Where there is a hierarchy larger than the local congregation, all that the forces of evil has to do to spread havoc all over the place is to get into the hierarchy of the church. And from the top down, from those who are above and over multiple congregations, from the top down to spread false ideas and false concepts. But the Bible limits the authority of elders. You see, Satan cannot with all of the forces that he has, cannot root up the church in all of the places on this earth where it is found because each congregation stands on its own. In the fourth place, we need to be reminded of the kind of lives that elders need to have. Those of you who will someday be elders in this very church And those of you men who are elders right now need to understand that your life needs to be the model life for the rest of us. Men and women in the church need to be able to look at your life and to say, that's the kind of life I want to to live. In fact, look in Hebrews chapter 13 where 
the writer says, verse 7, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken to you the word of God, whose faith follow. One translation says, whose faith imitate. The responsibility of those who are shepherds in the church is to walk in such a way, a life of purity, that if we put our feet in the very places where they have placed their feet, their footprints will lead us to heaven itself. Whose faith follow. Verse 17 says, To obey them, for they watch, for, watch out for your souls. They need not to be, or they need to be looking around them and to make sure that those who are following them are being matured in Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 5, at the bottom of the screen, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Now, watch this not as being lords over those entrusted to you. They watch for your souls. God has entrusted the souls of the members of this church. Johnny and Dan Fuller and Jerry and Joe who is not here. And today, Phil, to you. God has said, these are my sheep. I'm putting them in your trust. You take care of them. But then he says in the last part of that verse, not being lords, but being examples before us. We also need to be reminded that the authority of elders is limited. Sometimes people misunderstand the very aspect of the kind of work that elders do, but their authority, their authority is limited. Jesus says, Matthew 28, 18, you could quote this one, could you not? All authority, Jesus says, has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. How much authority of this kind of authority that's here? The Greek word is exousia. What kind, how much of exousia authority do elders have? Not one iota of exousia authority. Well, what do you mean by exousia authority? Well, he finds it in the next verse when he looks in Second Timothy in Luke chapter 22, when he says in verse 25, the kings of the Gentiles exousia exercise authority over them. And those who exousia over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. Why? Because Jesus has all the authority. The elders would have no right at all to set aside anything that Jesus had said. Well, the Bible says we, we could do it. We ought to do it this way. We're not going to do it that way. Sometimes people say, well, if the elders say it's all right for us not to immerse, but to sprinkle water. Or if the elders say they'd be all right to have women preachers in the church. Folks, elders don't have that kind of authority. Why? That kind of legislative authority, every bit of it, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. And the Lord says, in the church, in spite of the fact that there are those verses that says, obey them that have the rule over you, that's not exousia. In spite of the Bible says, be submissive to them. That's not exousia. Because the only absolute legislative authority there is belongs to Jesus. And the elders themselves are as subject to the exousia authority of Jesus as every member of the body of Jesus. It's important for us to recognize that. We'll talk a little bit later through some of these verses that talk about we need to submit to them. But it is not a lordship kind of submission. 
It is that God has given authority to them to lead the church, to oversee the church, to set the direction of the congregation and in those areas, in the application of the truths of God. Because you see, that authority is limited. But look again and look at the authority that is in the eldership. Sometimes we mistakenly think that an individual elder has an authority within. Oh no. That elder individually is as subject to the eldership as any member of the church. And so whenever the Bible says, verse, Hebrews 13, verse 7, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose face follow. Look at the word those. It's plural. Plural in form. In verse 17, Obey those, plural, who have rule over you. And be submissive, for they, plural, watch out for your souls as those, plural, who must give an account. You see, the very concept that there could ever be a head elder in the church is as far as there could be. That there'd be one elder who'd always get his way in an eldership. It's been my privilege many times to sit in meetings where decisions are made And where not over matters of faith and doctrine, but just over matters of judgment about what needs to be done for the spiritual health of the church. To see an elder say, I really think we ought to do it this way. And the eldership say, no, that's not what's best. And for that man to say, then I submit to what this eldership wants to happen. One of the strengths of the church is that when elders walk out of a place where they have made a decision, it's 100% unanimous because they submitted one to another in that. If you want to create a situation that will have unrest in a church, then let an elder... Let his own view and perhaps thinking, well, this might not have been a good idea for us to do it that way. Let it get out among the congregation that there is division within the eldership. And the church itself will be polarized by that very action. Elders, when they walk out of a place where a decision has been made, are submissive. Because they themselves are submissive to the chief shepherd. Number seven, elders are worthy of honor. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5 when he says, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Could we back up long enough to talk about the implication about what if an elder is not ruling well? He still needs to be honored as an elder that has been ordained and appointed by the Holy Spirit of God, even if he's not doing his job well. Sometimes we overlook that. I think of King Saul. When David had a chance on two occasions to kill that evil King Saul. David was in the cave, in the back of the cave, and Saul came in, and David had an opportunity to kill him there on the spot. Saul had his army trying to kill David. David had every opportunity to get rid of that evil king, and yet David said, I'm not going to touch, I'm not going to lay a hand against the Lord's anointed. That's why the verse a little bit later in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 19 says, Don't receive an accusation against an elder, except at the mouth of two or three witnesses. That's remarkable, isn't it? 
and how important it is for those of us who are sheep following our shepherds to never ever be guilty of hearing some statement made about some, some elder and becoming a part of that rumor mill that will sow discord, not over things that are known, not over things that could be established by two or three witnesses, but just over the matter of hearsay. Now, if an elder does wrong, how do you deal with that? Look at Paul's instruction in this passage, especially to those who are preachers, evangelists. But Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 to 18 says, If you have aught against a brother, go with him. By yourself, or go by yourself, take one or two witnesses with you, try to get them to repent, and then bring it to the church. Elders who are doing sinful things can be dealt with. And so Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, don't receive ever hearsay words you hear about elders, but if there are two or three witnesses, deal with that. And then he says, and them that sin, rebuke, publicly, that others may learn to fear. I am subject to this eldership. I'm a part of the sheep over which they oversee. I'm not an elder. I'm a sheep. But God's checks and balances against ungodly elders is a charge to those who preach, to those who are evangelists, you have the responsibility to deal with these matters. How painful those times are and how upsetting they may be is not the determination factor as to whether they should be done. They must be done because elders do not sit as a board of authority in the church that can run amok in, in any direction they want to, re, disregarding anything Jesus says. Let us conclude by talking about the, el, the work of elders. The names used to describe elders, words used to describe elders, show their work. There are three Greek words that are translated into six English words that describe what an elder is. He is an elder and a presbyter. What does that mean? Well, the Greek word is presbyteros, which might give you the idea and understanding where the word presbyter comes from. And it means that individual who is elder, older, spiritually mature. The Bible says you cannot appoint a man who is a new convert to be an elder. And the only time that was ever done was in that first century when they could immediately lay hands and develop spiritually minded men in the very beginning. The second word is bishops and overseers. While the word elder emphasizes their maturity, bishops and overseers emphasizes the authority that they have. But neither of these words describe their work. One talks about their maturity. Another talks about their right to make decisions and their responsibility to make decisions. But the last two words do from one Greek word, translated by, by the English words pastor and shepherd. What does a shepherd do? Leads me in paths of righteousness for his own namesake. I shall not want still waters and green pastures. He restores my soul. In John chapter 10, he lays down his life for the sheep. That's what the good shepherd does. Look at the last verse of this lesson, 1 Peter chapter 5. Peter was an elder in the church. He was also an apostle. And so he writes specifically to elders in the first four verses and then to others of us in verse 5 when he says, The elders that are among you I exhort. I'm a fellow elder. I'm a witness of the suffering of Christ 
and a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. There's the word elder. Shepherd, there's the word pastor. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers. There's the word bishop. Not by compulsion, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. When the chief shepherd appears, those men who are elders in this church or who someday will be elders, you're shepherd, but there's a chief shepherd. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Imagine just to any member of the church hearing the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. But what about that individual who by his life and by his dedication to the Lord has served as an elder? And on that day, the chief shepherd looks to those men and he says, Well done, fellow shepherd. How great that crown must feel. And verse 5, our responsibility, those who are younger, submit yourself to your elders. Yea, all of you be submissive one to another. Hello? All of you includes the elders themselves. While they are leaders, they submit their times and their energies and their devotion to God in order that this may truly be a flock of God. Be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Being an elder in the church ought not to make a man be filled with pride. That's why he says, not a new convert lest he fall into the temptation, lest he be lifted up with pride and fall in the condemnation of the devil. Not a place of pride, but a place where men yield their lives. And how blessed we are in this church. For those men, some of them, who have served for more than 30 years and molded and shaped this church by submitting themselves to lead us in paths of righteousness. God help us. We now come to that part of our service where one can become a child of God and become a part of the flock. How does that happen? To believe on the Lord. John 3.16 says that, but that's not just... The total, he's got to change his life. Acts chapter 17 verse 30 says he must repent of his sin. And when he's confessed his faith in Jesus, Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, he can be immersed, baptized in order that he might be baptized, buried into the very death of Jesus, and raised to walk in newness of life. Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, having his sins washed away by the blood of Jesus. The Lord adds him to the flock, to the church, to the kingdom, to the house of God. And then he says to those of us who've done that, don't you, got, don't you let up. You be faithful until you die. And I'll give you the crown of life. How can we help you today?